But yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of deaths. 17 over 24 months. Tonight, inmates at the Stony Mountain Penitentiary are dying at an alarming rate. Having to boil our water here all the time. Um, it's definitely more difficult, I think, because it's we're in the uh, dead of winter. There's no quick fix to the water woes affecting the capital of Nunavut. This truly is about a sovereignty for Indigenous people. It's about cultural revitalization. And help is on the way for the Indigenous tourism sector in British Columbia. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We start with some breaking news out of Ottawa. The Métis National Council is bringing a multi-million dollar lawsuit against members, consultants and staff connected to the former administration, as well as the Manitoba Métis Federation. The suit filed in Ontario Superior Court today alleges former MNC officials breached their fiduciary duty. The list of defendants includes former President Clement Chartier and current Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand. The suit describes an alleged, quote, scorched earth policy scheme that accuses them of, quote, inappropriate lump sum and severance payments to Cartier and former staff. MNC President Cassidy Caron posted a statement to Facebook explaining the suit was the result of an extensive internal review. We shared everything that was uncovered by this audit with our legal counsel, who have now compiled these pieces into a statement of claim against several individuals alleged to be involved in these matters. That statement has now been filed and you will surely be hearing about its contents. You might ask, why would I proceed with this matter if I am tired of the infighting and the division that has been sown across our nation? You may ask how we seek to facilitate the reunification of the Métis Nation while filing this statement of claim. These are good questions. The truth is that I believe the apparent actions of the past are impeding our ability to move forward in a positive way. APTN reached out to MNC and they will not be providing any more comments. We also reached out to the Manitoba Métis Federation. A spokesperson there says they also just received the statement of claim. An email was also sent to Clement Charche. There has been no response as of yet. None of the allegations have been proven in court. To read the full statement of claim, go to our website aptnnews.ca. We hope to bring you more on this story here tomorrow. A Pine Creek First Nation man has died in the Stony Mountain Institution in Manitoba. The death has the Southern Chiefs organization calling for a thorough investigation. Daryl Stranger has more. James Flatfoot is the latest inmate to die at the Stony Mountain Institute in Manitoba. According to Correctional Service Canada, Flatfoot died on January 23rd. He had been in the prison since December the 16th of 2021. Stony Mountain saw eight deaths in 2021 alone, and there has been 17 over the past two years at the institution. Southern Chiefs Organization Grand Chief Jerry Daniels wants to see a thorough investigation into the latest death. My question to those involved in this system is how many more times do we have to hear stories of First Nation men dying in jail? Winnipeg Free Press reporter Ryan Thorpe has been covering the deaths at Stony Mountain for years. You know, it's, it's violence, it's drug overdose, it's suicides, um, and, and sometimes it's illness, which raises questions about the level of medical care they receive. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of deaths, 17 over 24 months. I mean, that's, that's a death most months, right? Um, so it's, just, it's a serious cause for concern, in my opinion. Thorpe has also spoken with numerous families who are frustrated with the lack of information. A lot of cases with the families that I've spoken to have, have um, raised concerns about is the lack of transparency from, from Correctional Service of Canada. But in terms of the level of transparency this institution operates with, you often don't get much more than, the, than a four paragraph press release when someone dies and then they cite ongoing internal investigations. 
Flatfoot's death comes a few days after RCMP in Headingley, Manitoba, charged a prison guard at a provincial jail following an investigation into the death of William Ammo. According to SCO, 75% of adults admitted into custody are Indigenous, and in the last 10 years, there has been a 60% increase in the incarceration of Indigenous men. We need to move beyond the colonial justice system, and if we do that, we will reduce the overrepresentation of First Nation citizens within the mainstream criminal justice system and save lives. The RCMP and the coroner have been notified, and Correctional Service Canada will review the circumstances. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Now to Iqaluit, where our Kent Driscoll and every other resident of the city of 8,000 are still boiling tap water in order to drink it. Uh, Kent, what's the situation today and when do you expect to be able to use your water again? Thanks. The short answer is, we don't know. The long answer, we don't know and we won't really know for a while yet. But let's start with a quick review. A Calouit was under a do not consume order from early October until mid-December because fuel had been discovered in the water system. Starting in the middle of January, some residents smelled fuel in the water again. The city testing confirmed a small amount of fuel, well below federal guidelines, and decided to bypass the tank where they figure the fuel's getting in. So now we're getting water in the taps, but it's coming straight from the reservoir. It's lake water, so we have to boil it before consuming it. We caught up with the Iqaluit's mayor, Kenny Bell, earlier this week, and we wanted to know how much longer are Iqaluit residents going to have to keep boiling their water for? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know right now. Um, there's still just so many things, especially because, again, you know, we, we're so remote. Uh, having to fly in people uh, constantly takes time. Uh, the COVID situation, a lot of people don't want to come because of COVID. Um, you know, there's just, there's, there's so many variables that right now we just don't know. Since the beginning of this crisis, the city has been saying a longer term fix is needed. And that the longer term fix will cost around $184 million. You have to keep in mind, this water plant was first opened in the 1960s, and it's been added onto in an ad hoc way ever since. One city councillor described it as a Frankenstein water plant. Nunavut's MP, Lori Idlout, has been lobbying the federal government for the funds. Here, she explains just what a hassle it is to live in a city with water problems. Having to boil our water here all the time, um... It's definitely more difficult, I think, because it's we're in the uh, dead of winter and uh, it's stressful too with COVID being here. Now, when Idlout brings up uh, COVID there, uh, she's talking from experience. Uh, MP Idlout had COVID over the Christmas season and has since made a full recovery. As for the recovery of our water system, well, once the current bypass system has been tested for chlorine levels and they've had the results stay the same for a few days in a row, that boil order could come to an end. But the bigger picture, the water system problems, with Nunavut's short building season and remoteness, that full fix, that's easily years away. Back to you in Winnipeg. Thanks, Kent. To social media now, where Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller put out a 16-tweet tirade aimed at the suspected unmarked graves found at residential schools and at recent articles that deny a problem because no bodies have been exhumed. One of Miller's tweets says, quote, the ghoulish demand to see corpses. One article is unashamedly titled, in Kamloops, not one body has been found. Is not, one, is not only highly distasteful, but also re-traumatizing for survivors. The minister ends the thread with denying history won't change it, but it will further amplify the pain felt by Indigenous communities across Canada. Well, we'd like to hear what you think about Miller's tweets. Here's how you can continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Time now to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, Omicron continues to spread across the north. By protecting our little ones, let's help keep our elders and seniors, communities, and those who are unvaccinated safe.
Welcome back. The Northern Territories are feeling the sting of the Omicron COVID variant, including an outbreak at a correctional healing facility in Nunavut. Here's Sarah Connors with a look at COVID-19 across the north. The Northwest Territories is leading the North in COVID-19 cases at 952 confirmed cases. More than 400 cases are in Yellowknife. One person in the territory was in hospital as of last week. Despite the high case count, students in many communities returned back to school this week. Nunavut is also grappling with high case numbers at 279 confirmed cases. Current hospitalization data is not available for the territory. In Iqaluit, 12 people have tested positive at the Akiarvik Correctional Healing Facility. Stricter health measures are also in effect in Iglulik, where there's 55 cases. Indoor gatherings are limited and schools are closed until further notice. I know people have been concerned about going back to school. People Today have in Yukon, health officials urge parents to vaccinate their children. So By protecting our little ones, let's help keep our elders and seniors, communities, and those who are unvaccinated safe. There's 209 confirmed cases in the territory. Only one person is in hospital. Two long-term care homes have active COVID outbreaks. The government is distributing over 10,000 rapid tests to Yukon communities. Schools and early learning programs will also receive almost 3,000 tests. New temporary health measures were introduced last week, including limits on restaurants, bars and recreation sites. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Well, today kicks off the first day of Virtual Land Use Planning Summit uh, in Quebec. It brings big industry players and the Quebec government together to discuss post-pandemic development. Except the Assembly of First Nations Quebec Labrador weren't offered a seat at that discussion table and they're not too happy about it. Lindsay Richardson joins us now with a breakdown. Lindsay, thanks for being with us. Uh, for those outside of Quebec, what topics are being covered during this summit? Dennis, I could break it down for you in three words, and that's development, development, development. So that's obviously a very big theme for the current government, even more so in a post-pandemic world. So this summit brings together civil organizations, architectural firms, construction companies, heritage organizations, and it essentially gives them a platform to discuss how they can create a more prosperous and pros profitable Quebec in a post-pandemic world. So we already know of a handful of planned development projects on First Nations territory. So why wouldn't the AFNQL be invited to discussions? So when this happens, it's always a little bit unclear whether it's a genuine oversight or an intentional choice to exclude Indigenous groups. And in this case, it's much the same. It is worth mentioning that there is precedent here. For example, Quebec rejected the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples because it gives First Nations and Inuit the right to veto these economic development projects. And also earlier on in the pandemic, Quebec tabled a very controversial piece of legislation to kickstart the economy during the pandemic. And that bill also waived the right to consult with First Nations. So it's enough to make the AFNQL feel like there is a contempt for First Nations and Inuit input. But don't take it from me. We spoke to the interim regional chief of the AFNQL and he broke it down for us why it's important to make place at the discussion table for these leaders and these key players. We have Aboriginal rights and title. All of our territories are unceded. We have no treaties. So from our perspective, First Nations are the owners of our territories and Quebec needs to recognize and understand that, that the way that they have done business before is not the way that we see our involvement going forward. We want to be involved. We want to be part of the discussions. We want to be able to have the application of UNDRIP and the ability to consent. So, Lindsay, any response from the Quebec government at this point? It's kind of interesting, Dennis, because we contacted the government ministry that was mentioned in the AFNQL press release, and in an email response to us, they said they weren't actually responsible for organizing this summit and that the responsibility falls on the individual organizations that participated. But that wasn't enough uh, to really 
satisfy the AFNQL. So they were quick to draft a formal letter to Premier Francois Legault to remind him again of the responsibility to, con to consult on these issues, to consult on economic development. So we checked in with an AFNQL spokesperson, and as of yesterday, that letter and a handful of other letters that have been sent in the last six months of the pandemic have not yet received a formal response from the Premier. He has promised to take part in one-on-one -on -one political discussion tables with the AFNQL, so we're just going to have to see whether or not he intends to keep that promise moving forward into the year. Well, I'm sure you'll be keeping an eye on that. Lindsay, uh, appreciate it as always. Thanks so much, Dennis. To British Columbia, where the pandemic has massively impacted Indigenous tourism. 74% of Indigenous businesses geared to tourism had to lay off staff during the pandemic. The province of BC is providing funding to help restore the industry to pre-pandemic levels. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. According to the BC Ministry of Tourism, Indigenous tourism was one of the fastest growing sectors in the industry, generating over $700 million and more than 7,400 jobs. Indigenous Tourism BC reported that 90% of their businesses were closed or limited due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The BC government is providing $3.7 million to Indigenous Tourism BC to help Indigenous businesses return to their thriving levels by 2024. So that funding will go towards training, capacity building, um, um, alignment of our um, strategic plans uh, between us and the province and other organizations that are, are based in tourism and support to and, and resources to our stakeholders as well. Brenda Baptiste is the chair of Indigenous Tourism BC. She says the province has been their partners in building the industry. She stated the last two years have been challenging, but they work remotely to provide supports through lockdowns. She says Indigenous tourism is not just about economic development to communities. It also creates opportunities for cultural revitalization and identity. This truly is about uh, sovereignty for Indigenous people. It's about cultural revitalization and it connects communities, whether they're on reserve or off reserve, to that cultural identity. And then it connects that identity to the province of BC and hopefully someday we'll have that same vision for Canada. Lee Wilson, APT National News, Kitimat. APTN investigates returns this week. We've got a preview for you coming up after the break. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Our viewer John sent us this picture of a raven in Gillam, Manitoba that decided to pay John a visit. And the raven must have known what he was doing because John shared some food with him. Great pictures this week of wildlife getting close. Uh, be sure to stay safe and respectful with our animal neighbors. And keep those pictures coming by sending them to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at Friday's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, plus one with flurries in Halifax, minus four in St. John's. Minus 22 in Nain, snow and 12 below for Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Minus seven with snow in Montreal, 23 below in Shibugamu. Snow and 14 below for Sault Ste. Marie, minus five with flurries in North Bay. Snow and minus 11 for Thunder Bay. A cloudy day and 17 below for Sioux Lookout. Minus 18 in God's Lake and Norway House. 13 below with snow in Winnipeg. Minus 9 and snow in Brandon. 6 below in Regina. Cloudy and minus 4 in Saskatoon. Minus 2 in Meadow Lake. 3 below in Buffalo Narrows. In Northern Alberta, minus 2 in Fort McMurray. Plus 2 in Peace River. 8 above in Edmonton and Medicine Hat, plus 10 in Lethbridge. 6 above for Vancouver and Victoria. Minus 3 in Dease Lake with snow, plus 2 in Prince George. Minus 34 in Old Crow, snow and minus 1 in Whitehorse. Minus 21 for Yellowknife, 17 below in Norman Wells. Minus 26 with snow in Saks Harbor, 
29 below in Pulatuck. Minus 29 with snow in Whale Cove and Chesterfield. Minus 31 in Resolute. 33 below in Aglulay. In just a few minutes, so as Brett Forrester has the latest goings on in Ottawa, including an extensive interview with Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu. Here's Brett with a preview. Thanks, Dennis. Housing in Indigenous communities has been in the news for all the wrong reasons. From the tragic fire in Sandy Lake that claimed three children's lives to a new report that found substandard lodgings puts children at greater risk of respiratory illness. But the crisis has been well documented for years. So what does Indigenous Services plan to do about it? I'll ask the Minister that and much more. Then I'll be joined by the NDP's Indigenous Services critic, Lori Idlout. She accuses the Liberals of missing the mark in their approach to that issue. She'll explain why in just a few minutes on Nation to Nation. Thanks, Brett. Looking forward to it. Tomorrow on APTN Investigates, reporter Brittany Gio visits the Highway of Tears and speaks to the families of missing and murdered Indigenous men. Here's a preview. Start putting a spotlight on all these missing and murdered Indigenous men. He was walking by and I said, I'll see you later, bud. So then he went to school and then he had the meeting with the principal and he was supposed to go back to class and never did. There's so many people going missing. There's so much young kids. There's so much elders. What I did was I put a label in a baggie. Anybody anywhere that has, that sees my son, um, they'd have my phone number right on their phone. And it seems like it's one, one article in the paper and then it's never spoken of again. Every day I used to uh, call up north and talk to him and my auntie said that he was lost. I have to think that he's okay until I hear different. I just want him to come home. And you can catch part one of Brittany's documentary, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Men. That's tomorrow night, right here after the news. Well, that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For more, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and download the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Stick around Nation to Nation with Brett Forrester is up next. Have a great night. See you back here tomorrow.